all the glory forever. In the name and the authority of your only begotten Son, Jehoshua the Messiah, our Savior, we pray. So be so it. So be it. Praise John. Shabbat Shalom again, everyone coming in. Today's date is the 18th day of the third month, Savan, for the Jubilee year 6224 from creation, April 27th, 2024 AD. We have 12 more days of the latter rains, or we call spring, and the true summer season begins in 13 days. Praise Jah. Mm -hmm. Praise Jah. As we look at our 28 year cycle for the years 6217 to 6244, or 2017 to 2044, we're right here at 6224 where the arrow is. It's a Jubilee year, the 50th year. It's also Gregorian leap year as well. As we look at our yearly almanac with the four seasons of spring or the latter rains, summer, autumn or latter summer, and winter or the early rains, we have them divided up into the seasons. And these first three seasons that we're in right now and where we are is the 18th. Last week, we came off of the Feast of First Roots Pentecost. And it was a beautiful one, I have to say that. Now again, we have, if you can see, we have just over 12 days left before true summer begins, May 10th. Looking at our monthly almanac, once again, here we are. And we see that summer, again, May 10th, it begins on the sixth day of the week or Thursday evening. Mm -hmm. Now, as we get into this topic, family, this topic here about the 1,000 year reign is a very important topic. Many people know about this 1,000 year reign, but there's some details we want to kind of bring through. And this is a glorious time. This is the beginning of the Most High's kingdom that starts for 1,000 years on earth and then continues into the new creation. So it's very vital to get this information. And of course, we want to be in that kingdom. So be sure that you repent to the Most High keep the Most High's commandments and His Son's commandments in love and truth and increase your faith in them by walking in that love and worshiping them both in spirit and truth. So as we know, we have our six days of creation. John made everything in six days and he saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good, he said. And then John rested from all his works, which he created and made on the seventh day. It was a blessed day and set apart for holy use. And this is where we're on. We do all of our lessons during these, our live lessons during these times to give Ja honor and praise. I'm glad that those who are with us live are joining us and may the Most High continue to strengthen you and also those who are watching. Now, this seven day Sabbath is important in regards to this millennial rest, the 1000 year rest. And as you know, we teach that the Most High has seven-year cycles and they're patterned off of the seven-day creation cycle or the origination cycle. We'll get a quick read. Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days, Jah made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Jah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So Jah rested here, meaning he ceased to work. Now, we know that Jah wasn't tired. Or anything of that he has unlimited energy but he just ceased his work and he set an, an example for us for his people to also rest on the seventh day but it was also a prophecy or prefiguration of us being in his kingdom with him resting in his kingdom continuing leviticus 25 verse 3 six years thou shalt sow thy field and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for Jah. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. So once again, we see that this seventh year is also based upon the seventh day Sabbath. And as you can see, we have the idea or the notion of resting once again. Mm -hmm. So this rest is very important for us, and we're going to talk a lot about this rest as we get into this topic today. <clears throat> so we have our seven-day weekly cycle, as we know, and the seventh day we rest. And even though many people keep the seven-day Sabbath in a different fashion, some do it 
erroneously for 12 hours. Some erroneously started from the light time to the light time. But we begin it from the evening or the night time until the following evening or night time, which we say is the evening and the morning. And this rest is very important. We must keep it holy. And the reason why, you know, Jah has us keeping his rest because he rested from his works as well. And so these little mini Sabbaths that we're keeping every seventh day, showing Jah we honor him and, of course, living throughout the week in a, in a righteous, upright way as well, letting us know that we want to be in his kingdom and his kingdom on earth is going to be a rest. Mm -hmm. So we have the seven year sabbatical cycle as we just read before. And many people must know that we teach about the 7,000 year cycle where every day of the week is equivalent to one day, uh, 1,000 years. And so 1,000 years for each day of the week gives you 7,000 years and the last thousand years period of this uh, creation that we're in now will be a part of the Most High's millennial kingdom. Also, we'll be having the judgment during this time spilling over into the new creation. Scripture. Hebrews 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So we can see that there's a promise about Jah's rest. And he promises to the Israelites when they were to come into the land of Canaan, after coming out of um, Egypt, they would have a rest. And they went into that land, and for a little while it was okay. But for the most part, as you can see, the Israelites broke his covenant. So they really got never got that chance to really rest in the land. And this is why the Most High reserved this great rest for us for the future. And it, see, it says there, we can see that they didn't enter in this rest. They didn't want to join into Jah's kingdom because of faith, lack of belief. They didn't have faith. And... Faith is the greatest thing that we could have when we're coming forth to Jah. If I mean faith and love, we can say it that way. But if we don't have belief and faith and trust in the promises of the Most High, then we're showing that we don't, you know, we don't believe in Him truly. We might believe He exists, but we have to know that we must also trust Him. And one of the big words in verse three, as you can see, is it's a conditional word. If, right? If so, if we want to enter his rest, that means we have to be obedient. But if we're not obedient, then that if doesn't apply to us getting into the kingdom. So it's a conditional word and it depend, depends on you as an individual. So continue to strive, overcome, endure, and don't ever kind of sit back and think that you're doing enough to get into the kingdom because this is going to be a lot of the problems that people will find themselves in when they think that they're already in and they get kind of lackadaisical in their faith. Again, I want to say greetings and shout outs to all brethren and sisters coming in, you know, on this Sabbath day. May the Most High continue to strengthen you and guide you in truth and love and open up your understanding of his words and doctrines. Let's continue. Verse 4. For we speak in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and Jah did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. That's right. So again, we see here, sorry, unbelief, we see when we're coming to this understanding here. Right? Jah spoke this thing from the beginning of time. Jah rested. And so even at the end of this creation, we're also going to get into that rest, that 1,000-year rule that represents the Sabbath day. So again, some people are getting in, not all, a remnant, the little flock, the faithful, right? those who are true to the Most High. And indeed, his mercy will go far. So may it extend as far as Jah says it does, and that many, many will come in because we want mercy on ourselves as well. And we don't want to, you know, when we're kind of moving with the Most High, we're becoming part of his children. So I think it says somewhere like even the Most High, you know, he doesn't, you know, um, he's not happy when people die in their sins. He wants people to all men to repent and, and come to the understanding of truth and knowledge that they may get eternal life. This is what we were created for. 
we were created to live. And remember, you know, death is a real thing. So once you die this time in, in this physical life, you're not going to have another opportunity. So get it right now and prepare for your death, right? Your works follow you and you always want to be faithful and it's going to come. You can't escape it. So again, just be strong, be faithful and know that he who overcame death and conquered death also will give us that comfort as well. And we don't have to sorrow like other others, in, you know, who sorrow in the world with no hope. That's right. And these verses, um, when you compare verses three and six, you know, verse three says, we which have believed do enter in. And then verse six says, those who are first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. So we have to check our belief and our faith because you might think you're entering into Jah's rest and because of your unbelief, you're not getting in as many of those Israelites never entered in to Jah's rest. That's right. So keep the Sabbath holy. Don't just recognize it. Remember, we can pollute the Sabbath. That means doing your own thing, especially, you know, with social media distracting you all day long. Be careful how much time you're spending on your phone. I mean, this should be almost the day of the week that you're spending the least amount of time on your phone, really, unless you're doing something, you know, in particular, like watching a lesson like this. But we shouldn't be worried about self and vanity and all of those things because you can't save yourself. So be sure that you're not polluting the Sabbath and doing anything, you know, that, you know, most High might not want us to do on the Sabbath. He wants us to put away our pleasures, the things that he normally gave us to do for six days. You know, that's all right. Again, not to sin or anything, but we have certain pleasures. You might want to li like listen to music or doing a certain thing that way. But when it comes to the most high Sabbath, again, he wants you to have it set apart for holy use to honor him. And it's also not a day just to sleep away at all, but. I know it's a good day to get some extra rest and go to sleep a little bit early. And maybe if you can, you can, you can sleep in a little bit later. But be sure to use this time wisely, read, study, pray, and be humble before the Most High. It's a good reminder, Brother Sean. Um, and also, you know, taking this Sabbath day seriously, it's a reminder. It's a weekly reminder that every week that when we get into this Sabbath day, it's like a prefigure of getting into Jah's kingdom. It's something that we should be looking forward to, something that we should be preparing our minds for and 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 greatly looking forward to because it prefigures Jah's kingdom to come. And when we want to take this um, calling seriously, you know, you'll be better equipped to keep this day holy, recognizing that when you get into Jah's Sabbath and into his kingdom, you won't have to worry about worldly and things. That's All right. those things will be passed away. All the stresses of life, all the struggles, all the things of the world will not be in Jah's kingdom. So don't worry about them on this day. There's no sure. need for them. Exactly. The it's, Sabbath day is important. And I know, again, like I said, the debates can range of what, how to keep it, where to keep it, and, and all of this and that. But if you know what it is and you're polluting it, then you're not doing yourself any good. So keep the Sabbath holy. Let's continue. Verse 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of Jah. Now, in these verses here, we can get an understanding that Again, Jah is serious about the seventh day, and he doesn't want us to harden our hearts. You see, the Sabbath day is one of those things that, you know, you can look at days as, hey, well, you know, nothing, time really doesn't belong holy or anything. It doesn't really matter, but Jah says it does, and there is a rest for us. And this rest is talking about the 1,000-year rest in his kingdom. But also in verse 8, if you have a, a normal Bible, a KJV, it'll probably have the name Jesus there. And this is one way that we know that and I mean, many people know already, besides the arguments about the letter J and all of this and that, many mm -hmm. people know that Jesus' name, if anything in English, should have really been Joshua. And here when they put Joshua, they're speaking about Joshua, son of son of none at this time here, right? He never gave them rest when they came into the land of Canaan, right? And he spoke about other times, other things that's going to happen after that. So that wasn't the full rest. So once again, we see, again, just looking at the names of Joshua and Jesus and just good to know these things on a basic level. You don't have to go outside the Bible to really see that the Messiah's name should have been Joshua. And I know all about the Hebrew, Yahweh Shah, 
and Yahshua and all of that, but you'd have to have an Hebraic understanding. I'm just speaking strictly if you're coming from a, you know, you have your Bible only, your KJV, and that's the only thing that you had to read. You can see a couple of times that the Messiah's name is called Joshua, and this is one of them. Good Let's point. continue. Verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, he also had ceased from his own works, as Jah did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. All right. So notice it says that we have to work to get into the rest. Right? That's right. Six so, days thou must labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. That's right. So we have to labor to get into Jah's kingdom. Nobody's walking into this thousand year reign um, with ease. This is not a cakewalk. You're going to be tried and tested and found worthy or not worthy to enter in. That's right. So make today the day, right? Don't harden your heart. Make now the time. Don't again wait for something special to turn it up. Continue every day turning it up, moving closer to the Most High, overcoming ourselves in discipline that way. So we have to, again, get into this just 7,000-year plan of salvation, and it's the focus here is on the 1,000-year rule. And one thing I want to kind of show in this area here is that during this 1,000-year rule, salvation is going to be offered big time to human beings, that there will be human beings on the earth, mortals. Let's call them mortals. I know the people who are in Jah's kingdom, the saints, they're going to be immortals. So sometimes I'll be for referring to them as the immortals, and then the mortals will be human beings. And during the 1,000-year reign, you're going to have immortals dwelling with mortals. And, I mean, it kind of goes that way now, too. It's just that we can't see the angels and the Messiah. But at mm -hmm. that time, we will be physically, we will have a body like the Messiah's, right? A spiritual flesh and blood body. Now, this body might not be the same body that you get into the new kingdom, the new heavens, the new earth with the new name and the new Jerusalem, because everything's going to be new. And in, in the scriptures, I see somewhere that no, our bodies are going to be kind of changed uh, to something different and unique for that kingdom. Mm -hmm. But as of now, we're going to be like the Messiah. So during that 1000 year period, you know, a lot of human beings more than now, you know, people are going to have like, you're going to see the Messiah and you're going to have almost a, a greater witness, even though people will still reject, you know, the truth. And Paris, same way. So the Oxford Dictionary defines the word millennium as 1,000 year reign of the Messiah on earth, a period of great happiness and prosperity. And of course, I could not agree any more than that, because guess what? It's, it's a peaceful time. It's not a time of labor, not a time of sorrows. You're going to have your new body. Everything is going to be on a higher, higher spiritual plane and level, a joy and a smile that can't be wiped off your face ever again. It's going to be beautiful. And we're going to be able to spend it on this earth here. And God's going to bless this earth. This earth is beautiful. Right now, it's not so good because mankind is fouled it up with sin and everything. But when God does bring the blessings back and brings, you know, the fountain of life here and all of the great things, the paradise that it should be, it's going to be a lovely place to be, to dwell with. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. Again, if these things, is this what the scriptures teach about this heavenly, sort of heavenly space on earth? Yes, it does. And we can prove these things. So we're going to be looking at things like when does the millennium start? Where will the millennium be spent? And I mean, we know that's on earth, but we'll look at a couple of verses the same way. What will true believers be doing during the millennium? What's the role of Israel and the nations, the mortals, in that 1,000-year reign? Because as you know, everybody's talking a lot of hot topics these days, especially amongst Israelites, about getting into the kingdom and kind of <laughs> beating up the, you know, the Gentiles as they serve you and kind of putting mm -hmm. the punishment back on them. But there's a little bit of a misunderstanding when it comes to that. And this is these are big yeah. things. If you kind of have that in your mind, and that's what you think the kingdom is going to be about, you going in there and just ruling over people and you know, kind of taking out our um vengeance on them, it doesn't go like that at all. The vengeance will already be carried out before that even 1000 year reign really officially starts because the Messiah is going to come and slaughter all those wicked. Nonetheless, 
we're going to get into this topic. And if there's any questions on this topic, feel free to put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Daniel 2, verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the El of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom that shall be left to other people, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. All right. So when we get into this understanding here about this, uh, what we just read, as you know, many people know about this, uh, the golden image, so to speak, or the golden, silver, bronze, and iron image, the great image of the kingdoms of the heathen that will rule the earth until the Messiah returns. And all of these kingdoms here have already passed by, Babylon, Persia, the Greek, Ptolemy, and now we're, and even Ptolemy with Rome, now we're getting into the future Rome, right? As we start to build up and close in on the last 200 years of, you know, this first creation here. Mm -hmm. And as we see that, uh, when David read in verse 44, after these kingdoms are mashed up by the Messiah, then the millennial rule, the eternal kingdom will be set up. Let's get a little bit more of a read. Daniel 2 verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. So once again, this is a very familiar image and understanding of these various nations that came upon the scene. Just wanted to share them with you. And it's after, again, these things are the Messiah conquers the last future Rome kingdom that the eternal kingdom will start to be set up. So we know that this stone that was kind of cut out of a mountain represents the Messiah. And it, it comes and it kind of crushes and makes Babylon fall. And this is where that saying comes into play, you know, Babylon will fall, right? Or Babylon must fall. Let's get us some read here. Daniel 2 verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's right. The stone is representative of that Messiah, our rock. And he is the king of this great mountain, which is Jah's kingdom that fills the whole earth. This is an earthly kingdom. It's not something that is just going to be extended only within Israel, but it's going to extend further out in, in a great way. That's right. And this stone that comes in the very near future is, is going to come at the end of this Babylonian kingdom. That's why it says it's smoting his feet, this future Roman kingdom to come. Um, that's where that mark of the beast and a lot of the things you see in Revelation will be, will be set up during those times. Yes. Daniel 2, verse 44. And in, the, and in the days of these kings shall the El of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So this is the great kingdom of heaven that will be forever that we're trying to get into. Right? We want eternal life and to get into this kingdom, not just to get in, but the fact that if you know what the Messiah said, he said, the kingdom of heaven kind of starts within you, right? And so that means having the Holy Spirit within us is part of the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is really near. And once we have that Holy Spirit, it's like we are now being transformed into citizens of Jah's kingdom. And without, you know, without the citizens and the residents of the kingdom, you couldn't have a kingdom. And this is what it's about. 
So be sure to understand that, you know, don't wait for the Messiah to come in the future. Live good now. And, you know, if I were you, I'll give you good advice. Don't be looking for the Messiah to come and all kind of prophecies to happen. Keep watching. Don't get me wrong. But prepare, you know, to just live and carry out your days and to overcome sin and temptation until you die. And that's what you have to really be focused on. Don't be just focused on always, when is he going to come? When is he going to come? When is he going to come? Because he gives us certain signs of his coming. And it's not until the you know future. And even if it was to be soon, you still want to still focus on who you are and your work that you have to do in faith. That's right. Good word. We have to prepare ourselves and working on yourself to be the person, the man or woman of Jah that he wants you to be because you don't know when that time comes, when he might take you away, and that time is done. Your time on earth will be done, and you will not have the opportunity again to serve Jah. So serve Jah now to the best of your ability, so you can be found worthy to enter into this rest. That's right. So the Messiah's return to earth is the start of the millennial reign. The 1,000 years. And remember, reign requires a king, a territory, government, laws, administrators, civil servants, judges, health officials, and residents of the kingdom. So just think for a moment of all the levels of government in your country. And it'll give you some idea of what is meant by the word reign and the tens of thousands of officials or civil servants which make this reign possible. There's going to be something for everybody to do in this kingdom. We're going to have power and authority. And again, this power and authority is going to be like how the world has it now. You know, the Gentiles are the governments, the police force, the military, all of these things you see on the screen in terms of administrating their kingdom. And this kingdom right now is not the Messiah's kingdom. Otherwise, he would have fought for a long time ago. This is the devil's kingdom, and it's given unto him for a period of time. And that period of time is coming to an end in the year 6430 or the year 2230 AD in the future, which is about 206 years away remember mm -hmm. i didn't say when the messiah is going to come but this is going to you're going to understand prophecy about the times of the gentiles and jacob's troubles as you start to follow our chronology and our prophetical teachings you'll see that this time period when this time period comes then that's when we should start looking for the end and that's exactly when the trumpets and all those things were, are going to start appearing on the scene and the seals and all of those they're wonderful things, but they're also dreadful things. And you want to make sure you're on the Messiah's side. But this is in the future, family. And I know many people don't believe that, but that's okay. Even if the Messiah does come next week or anything, I don't think it would be anything wrong that way. But I do know from prophecy that we're still in the 10th, 700-year cycle. And we're still also in the sixth uh, trouble of Jacob's trouble, which is the final and last trouble. And we're in the seventh time of the Gentiles as well, simultaneously, all three at once. Six, trouble of, Je of Jacob's, the seventh trouble of the times of the Gentiles, and the tenth 700-year cycle of which the Messiah will come in. Lots That's of right. information. Scripture. Revelation 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So this binding starts to become the same 1,000 year period of the Messiah as well. So when we're on earth in this kingdom uh, for that millennial rule, the devil is going to be locked away as well. And pretty much I would maybe think also, you know, his evil angels as well. Um, that way, but it says the devil, but I know sometimes when it says the devil, it's re speaking of all the evil angelic hosts, but yes. he won't be out here to tempt us, right, and to sway anybody, we will still have, not we who are in the kingdom, the immortals won't have a sinful nature, but human beings, the mortals, will still have a um, an evil nature, and again, they're going to have the opportunity to repent when the Messiah is here, if they're not destroyed in that great Armageddon war. Verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat out upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded 
for the witness of Joshua and for the word of Jah, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with the Messiah a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. On, this, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of Jah and of the Messiah, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Wow, praise Jah. Praise Jah. So you can see a lot about here the thousand years, and this is something that, again, mm -hmm. we have to be taught, because people are taught usually when they die, they're going to go right to heaven. <laughs> That's not so. We have to rest in the grave as well and wait for the first resurrection, as it says right there, right? The first resurrection. So there's two resurrections. Now, during the this time here, you want to get into the first resurrection because being into the second resurrection is not a good thing. You're going to receive probably the judgment of eternal damnation and the lake of fire, and that's not good. But I am going to speak a little bit about there will be some righteous people in that second resurrection, but those are going to be the righteous people that are alive after the first resurrection, mortals on the, uh, on the earth during the millennial reign. So those human beings that will die during that 1,000-year reign, normal, regular mortals, they're going to come back in the second resurrection, but their names are going to be found in the book of life. And that's the difference there. That's right. So can you imagine? Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. Brother Sean, um, but can you imagine a world for a 1,000 years without the influence of Satan the devil? And his deception that he's deceived the whole world that's mm -hmm. um you know it's, it's hard to imagine but it's going to be great mm -hmm. and the same time he's locked up is the same time that the messiah is on the earth so now we're going to have great 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 strength and great spirit is going to be upon the earth and blessings will be abundant so you want to get into this kingdom this first resurrection family right it says on the second death that means there's two ways, there's two deaths. The first physical death that we go through, and then the second death where you're destroyed in the lake of fire. But that won't have any power over us because we're going to be immortal. And it says we're going to reign with the Messiah as kings and priests for a thousand years. So we're going to be like uh, helping those mortals try to get eternal life. And then at the same time, we'll be resting in bliss and a beautiful thing with all the saints starting probably from right down to Adam. Uh, anything you want to add for this, these words here, Dean? Um, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot to um, to take in, but, you know, focusing on verse 4, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Joshua and for the word. You know, there's going to be a martyrdom, and there's going to be those of us in the future who are, the devil is going to um, attack and kill many of us in the future but right. they're sealed in jaws kingdom still mm -hmm. yeah man and remember back in the past the prophets were killed many righteous men were killed if you read um hebrews chapter i think 11 the chapter of faith you Many bad things happened to those early prophets, even the apostles and many believers in the past. But as David said, there will become another martyrdom up in the future. But do know that, hey, if if you you know are martyred for, for the Messiah and for the word of the Most High, you're going to get a very special resurrection and place in John's kingdom. That's right. And even when it says those who had not worshipped the beast, neither received his image or the mark upon their foreheads, you know, that mark coming up in the future, in the future Roman kingdom, is going to be um, a very serious thing. You're going to have to be facing death or take that mark. Better to face death than to take that mark. Because if you take that mark, you're already marked for death in Jah's eyes. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you might live a little bit longer. It might even be a year or so, but you're going to lose your eternal life. See, this is what it's about. We're in training grounds here in our physical bodies and in this physical realm. And we just want to overcome this training so we can become immortal beings. So do your best, right? So that you can be born and reborn into Jah's kingdom and become a spirit being like the Messiah. So again, where and where is this reign and when is it? On earth. That's right. Scripture. Revelation 5, verse 10. 
and has made us unto our L kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Matthew 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So again, the earth is where this kingdom is going to be set up initially, and then we're going to have a new heavens, a new creation, a new universe. Revelation 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our master and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. That's right. So the prophets and all people in the future and through these present times will get a resurrection, a first resurrection, if we stay faithful to the Messiah's name and love. Daniel 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all other all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. That's right. So we see again, as David said, there's going to be a tribulation, a martyrdom coming up in the future, right? There's a devil here through this horn, this human being, the devil is going to basically, you know, possess that body. He's going to war against the, the saints, the Israelite saints and Gentile believers as well who are clinging to them as well. And they're going to have to do that until the end, until the Messiah comes. But when the Messiah does come, it's going to be a great day. And the saints are going to have to lift up their head for their salvation is going to be so close and near. And many will be perishing at that time. But then in will come our Savior and again, give them a resurrection to eternal life. That's right. Praise Jah. Genesis 27, verse 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Mm -hmm. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shall serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. So looking at these verses, you know, this is the blessing that Isaac put upon uh, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob went with the eternal blessings. Obviously, Esau got some physical earthly blessings. But you see here in verse 40, it says, by his sword, his weapons, he shall live. So Esau and the nations against Israel today, they survive by their weapons, right? And it's by their military might and everything that they control this world. And that's why that's right. in the future when the Messiah comes and to war against, you know, the future hedonistic nations, they're going to be all high teched up with their tanks and all of this and that. And all the military is going to try to come in and deal with the Messiah, but he's going to crush them with the saints, you know, with the fire of his mouth and all kind of mm -hmm. wonders are going to occur. And then those people who are destroyed are going to, of course, be, re you know, they're going to be waiting until their judgment. But those who survive or are not destroyed they're going to become servants of the Messiah. That's and I don't right. mean servants like the resurrected saints, but servants of Israel in the new kingdom. But one thing it says, by thy sword thou shalt live and shalt serve thy brother. And when it comes to pass, thou have the dominion. So right now the dominion has been changed from the sheep to the goats. Mm -hmm. now black In terms of all the black nations have been gotten crushed back by Alexander the Great. The last uh, black nation was the Medes and the Persians. Um, that way. And before that, most of those nations were all black nations, Babylon, Israel, 
Egypt and, and the likes. But now the Gentiles are on the scene. This is the time of the Gentiles and Esau represents these times of the Gentiles, but it's soon over. And then after that's over, we're gonna have Jacob or the time of the Ethiopians, the time of the sheep are gonna start once again. Let's take a read here. In the Apocrypha, 2 Ezra 6 verse 7. Then answered I and said, what shall be the parting asunder of times? Or when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it that followeth? And he said unto me, from Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand, Jacob's hand first held the heel of Esau. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. That's right. So that little scenario we read where, you know, uh, Jacob grabbed the heel had prophetical meaning. Who would have thought that it meant something prophetical? But it's letting you know that as Esau came out first, he's ruling during these times, but the hand a part of Jacob has also reached out. And by the end of Esau's rule, Jacob's rule is going to start. And it's going to be, of course, headed by the Messiah himself. That's right. Uh, luminous mind games puts in Rome is iron. Iron and clay is Christendom. The beast of the sea. Islam is the beast of the earth. Well, in terms of in particulars, we do know that anything dealing with the beastly system is dealing with Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So in that sense, it's true. Also headed by um, Rome that way. So I mean, it's, it's a good word in that understanding, but it probably would have to be more detailized. But nonetheless, thanks for the comment. Let's continue on. So I want to show you some time frames here of Jacob's troubles in the times of the Gentiles. Um, the end of the time of the Gentiles ends in the year 6430 from Christian or 2230 AD. So remember, we're in 2024. So this is 206 years in the future. Uh, into the future where the times of the Gentiles will be finishing and Jacob's troubles. Again, we're not saying, I'm not saying that's exactly when the Messiah comes, but after that time frame is over at 6430 mm -hmm. or 2230, and the trumpets are already probably going to be sounded. That's going to be the last little bit there. And the Messiah is going to probably come within very shortly after that time. The day or hour knows no man, but we do know the signs and the Messiah also gives us signs of prophecy as well that we can follow to know where we are in prophetical time frames. That's right. So in just 7,000 year timeline, as you know, when we count, count chronology, we start from year one to the far left. And year one is equivalent to 4199 BC. And then we have year two, three, four. And as we know that the BC starts to decrease. And as we move through, um, hold on here. Yes. As we move through, we get to 3910, 4199, which is 1 BC, and then 4200 is year zero. And after that, 4201 is 1 AD, and we're continuing through. And here we are at 2024, or 6224 from creation. And in the future, 6430 is when the times of the Gentiles will come. So it'll be sometime after the year 6430 or 2230 that we're going to have the Messiah's return. So again, That's not right. saying which exactly, but it's during this time period. And you can see we have 3910. Now these, what these dates are, this is the date of when Alexander's rule began because he's the goat that began the goat's rule, the, the time of the Gentiles, when he killed off the Medes and the Persians. A lot of people want to start the times of the Gentiles from Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, but that's an error. It starts from the goats and these Gentiles, the straight-haired, who are ruling the world now. And it goes into the future, and it's for 2,520 years, which is a scriptural understanding. And I'll, on the next slide, I'll give you a bit more understanding. And it goes to the year 6430, and that will be the end of Jacob's troubles and the times of the Gentiles, which are one and the same period. That's right. Want to add anything here, D? Um, when we say the times of the Gentiles, we read about Jacob and Esau before. That's the end of Esau's dominion. His world rule will come to an end once that times of the Gentiles and Jacob's troubles have been fulfilled. That's right. That's right. So the end of this year, that those years, yes, Esau's rule will end. So just giving you an understanding of a child. I can't get too in-depth on it because we do have a lesson on the times of the Gentiles and Jacob's troubles, and it's very particular but just to give you some figures of the year 3910 or 290 bc 
again, when Alexander came on the scene and ruled, not just when he came on the scene, but when his rulership um, started. And this is Jacob's seven troubles and the times of the Gentiles, which equals 2,520 years. And it's from the year 3910, or from creation uh, 290 BC to the future, 6430, 2230, which is over here. And this whole period, this treasure just covers the 1260 days times two gives you 2520. And this 1260 days you can find in Revelation. And when you look at these troubles and the times of the Gentiles, there's seven troubles of Jacob. And each trouble lasts 360 years. So each column is 360 years. And you can see we've given some dates and understanding. And right now we are in the seventh trouble or the last of the 360 years. However, though, one trouble has been shortened from here. So it's actually six troubles, which equals seven troubles and it's just an overlapping theme because Josh said he's going to shorten one trouble. So this is how it is, is understood by us. And we are in this last 360 year period. And of this 360 year period, we're in the last 206 years of it. This That's trouble right. started in 1870, a little bit after the Atlantic slave trade was, was over. And again, if you just want to look at the dates on this uh, chart here, you can see various dates going with the times of the Gentiles and you know, various things happening. Again, I don't want to get too deep into it now because this is a whole two and a half lesson. hour lesson by itself. Yeah, lesson in itself. But um, I want to give you an understanding. But these are good charts nonetheless. And, um, you know, to put it in a nutshell, the scriptures testify that Job punished Jacob seven times for his sins and the, and the children of Israel. And... Those times represent prophetical years, and each time is a 360-year period. And the beginning of this punishment occurred, as Sean mentioned, when Alexander the Great first, um, when he conquered the per Persian and Mede Empire, and that began the times of the Gentiles and Jacob's troubles. Right. So those 360-year time periods has has uh, has extended all the way up until now, and will not end until another 206 years. That's right, D. Deep stuff, family, deep stuff. Let's move on. So we have the seventh trumpet, and it's during this time is the first resurrection, the last trump. We have Jehoshua beginning rule over the earth with the resurrected Israelites and believers in the Messiah. The Messiah rules over nations. He conquers the world, ruling Gentile nations and the heathenistic nations with a rod of iron. Jah's law is universal on earth. Israel will be the authority and teachers of Jah's ways. And the nations will rebuild the earth under the authority of Israel. And people will be born and dying during this 1,000 years, but not the saints, not the immortals. Only the mortals will be living and dying and having babies and all that. Immortals won't be having any babies or any copulation or of, of that sort at all. That's right. We'll be like the angels. Yes. Our joy will be much greater. So an understanding again of the seven seals. And I mean, this is just a quick understanding. All this can be lessons in itself. But it's during the seventh seal that we have our seven trumpets that begin. And once the seventh seal comes and the trumpets begin to sound, we have our seven trumpets. And it's during the seventh trumpet right here that after Satan's kingdom is on earth for three and a half years or th yeah, three and a half years, it will be destroyed by the Messiah when he comes. But during that three and a half years too, the last of it, they're going to get a lot of plagues in that kingdom, darkness and all kinds of things, just like how it was when um, the Israelites left Egypt with plagues mm -hmm. and wonders. It's going to be That's the right. same thing um, during this time period. And all of these times are kind of like simultaneous they, they move on. They have a chronological sequence to them, but they're basically happening within you know, the same time frames. That's right. And what will be occurring at that time is Jah's wrath upon the heathenistic kingdoms of the world. That's right. All these plagues and these trumpets are part of Jah's wrath on the earth, the heathenistic nations. So let's look at Jacob's troubles and the time of the Gentiles. 
Again, it ends in the year 6430, 2230. Here now is just like a, an end time uh, timeline. So starting from the right, you know, we have 6430 from creation. So this is up when the, the trumpets and everything, once the time of the Gentiles have come to an end, and along with Satan's um, Satan's rule here, we have the trumpets and the vials. Then the Messiah comes, and there's the war. He returns, and there's the war, so to speak, of Armageddon. The beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. So we look at this thousand-year period, the one thousand-year reign of the Messiah, and the first resurrection occurred during this time. Satan is also locked up. And again, the beast, the false prophet are in the lake of fire for that 1,000 years being tortured. And That's Satan's right. being tortured in the bottomless pit as well. And um, hold on, sorry. And what do we have here? The second resurrection occurs. This is just an error there. I think it's from the uh, behind the screen. Second resurrection and the white throne judgment occurs. The second death in the lake of fire. But before that, sorry, going into these these um, circles here. Satan's released first. He gathers the nations. Then Job burns them up. Then we have the second resurrection, right. the judgment, and then we go into a new heaven and a new earth. Does this chart make sense, D? Yes, yes. But it's a good um, the explanation has to come with the chart. But yes, it does help to um, it does it does visualize help those of us who need to to read to visualize the sequence of events of how how and when these things occur mm -hmm. so we're way back here like you know we're back here at 64 30 2024 and as we move through time this is the end 64 30 22 30 again the end of the gentiles times of the gentiles and jacob's troubles and everything else is flowing through again everything is simultaneous here that's right so during this thousand year reign um you know people a lot of israelites want to harp on um you know the heathens being our servants you know, this servitude is not forever, right? The servitude for those um, mortal beings alive during that time is, is, is going to be only for a thousand years. That's right. One thing you got to know, too, during the first resurrection, those who come into that into that kingdom for the first resurrection, none of the wicked that are alive now are going to be in that kingdom. So, you know, the Herods and all of the wicked men now and all the cops and everybody that did all these wicked things to, to, to Israelites over the years and were very evil just throughout time. None of them are going to be in that 1000 year reign. So we won't, we're not going to be beating them, or punishing them or anything of that nature. But their descendants, their children are going to be up in the future. And those who did wicked to Israel and to wicked to the earth, they're going to be in the second resurrection. So when we're That's ruling right. on earth against with over these Gentiles that are going to be coming, we're going to be righteous rulers. And those who we rule over, many of them are going to turn to Jah in their mortality. Right. So when you have a servant that is going to be fixing up the earth and is going to be willing to do those things, those are they're being grafted into Israel right then and there. And they're going to be beginning keeping Jah's laws and commandments and statutes on earth as well. It's going to be the wicked nature is going to be out there. The wicked are going to be out there. Some may not want to come deal with just still, but nonetheless, those that we rule over, you know, they're going to build up places. We're not going to, if there's anybody who wants to commit crimes against Jaws law, they're going to get the death penalty or the punishment really quick, so to speak. Jaws not going to have no long court cases or anything of that nature. But I want to let you know again, the Gentiles that are in that, in that future, they're going to be serving the Israelites and those People who personally have servants or whatever, you know, those those individuals are going to have a chance to come into Jah's kingdom for that one thousand year reign. That's right. They're going to die, and you know, and they're going to be buried and all of that. So this is a little bit of an understanding, but we have a lot more to read. So I think we got to get into it. You have any last words here, D? No, well said, brother. All right. So there are two resurrections. Again, resurrection to eternal life. These are the servants since the beginning that were faithful to the creator. They will rule for the for 1,000 years on this old earth and then eventually live forever. As well, the resurrection to eternal damnation is the second resurrection. These are all the people who rejected the creator's mercy. The lake of fire is the second death. But believers from the 1,000 years will be in the book of life 
So like I said before, those who do come into Jah's kingdom during that 1,000 year reign, when, they're, when they do their physical death, so to speak, they're going to be coming in that second resurrection where it's going to be mostly wicked, but there's also going to be the book of life being read and all the names of the righteous will be in that book. That's right. And I hope that makes sense to a lot of people because believe it or not, this is a very challenging topic for people. You know, people wonder if, you know, we're going to get another chance. And <clears throat> I can't even go into all the different understandings about the 1,000 year rule, the judgment, the first and second resurrections. There's a lot, a lot of errors. And we do believe with our research and guidance from the Most High, you know, this, this is the way that how it really goes. This is the truth and the sequence of events, how it happens, and this understanding. Now, if, even if we are, I always pray to Jah to correct us and guide us in truth. But, you know, over the years, we've been doing diligent research in, in these areas. And even our elder David Ray, who passed away, he, was a, he had great understanding in these areas. And this is why he wrote his five books regarding the New Kingdom and Jah's Almanac. That's right. Now, I was going to read the Valley of the Dry Bones, but I just want to skip through a few verses. So I want to still have D Dave read it. And the reason why is because, you know, some people just say that this the Valley of the Dry Bones is um, when it's speaking about what, what you see clearly is the, the first resurrection. Um, people say that it's just, you know, an enlightening that Israel is going to be awakened in these times and they're going yeah. to have, you know, an understanding of the Most High and come back to him. And those things are true, but this doesn't refer to that, uh, the dry bones. This dry bones is referring strictly to that first resurrection where we're going to have immortal bodies, but yet there's still going to be, like it's going to be a flesh and bones spiritual body, just like the Messiah had. Remember, he, he told Thomas, I think, put his hand in his side and it was like flesh there. And it's he said he wasn't a spirit. He still had flesh and bones. He ate, but at the same time, he was able to disappear, fly, and had great powers. All of these things we're going to have too, but we're going to still be um, looking like this before we get our new body in the new heavens and the new earth. That's right. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of Jah was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of Jah and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Jael, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Jah. Thus saith Jael unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am Jah. Mm -hmm. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was no breath in them. So right off the bat, you get you get a good understanding. This is talking about the resurrection. Clearly, it's almost like a detailed version of the resurrection of how it goes. It's, it's going to bring them back, going to cover them with sinews and flesh, and the bones going to come together. It's going to put breath in them. This is an awesome thing and demonstration of the resurrection. So, you know, all the heathenistics doctrines of christianity when you die you go to heaven no when you die you rest on the earth now i will say one thing about heaven there will be certain believers in the first resurrection who will go into heaven and who will be before the throne of the most high and it'll be a great 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 multitude and it says actually they might be there you know forever but i do know that they will be there for a time period for sure but it's not like they've died and then as they die they go to heaven they're going to come in the resurrection some of them will be before Jah's throne in heaven, and yet there's still the kingdom on earth will still be going on. <laughs> I know these mm -hmm. things are um, challenging, but this is how it's going to go. And especially if the kingdom does come down to heaven, I know that heaven is still going to be there. It's just that the, the Messiah and his tabernacle are going to be on earth with us. But heaven will still be a place where the Father dwells. That's right. 
So, you know, looking at, the, again, the bones, this valley of dry bones, it was a great, great valley. Continuing. Verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith Jael, Come from the four winds, O breath, and bre breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Mm. Then said he unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith Jael, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am Jah, when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and thou, sh and thou shalt put my and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, Jah, have spoken it and performed it, saith Jah. Praise Jah. Praise Jah. See these things. It's very explicit about the first resurrection. So I, sometimes I, it boggles me how I see people say that it's it's symbolic, and I mean. Well, it is symbolic, but it's symbolic of the first resurrection, not just symbolic of an awakening for the people. It's too detailed here, man. We have the graves opening and flesh and yeah. bones and I mean, all of these things and breath coming into them, and it says that they lived. You're seeing so, a, a literal resurrection here. This is more than just an awakening of Israel, of who we are as a people. That's right. It's not to do nothing to do with that at all. Although us being awakened to knowing who we are and all people – you know, knowing the truth is occurring, but you can't use these verses for that. These verses right. are strictly for the resurrection. And besides, this is a prophecy, and this has not occurred yet. To a lot of people who believe that um, Israel is receiving their awakening, they're thinking that this, that right now, is the awakening. That's right, yeah. Right? And mm. you don't see no resurrection right now. So this is no. not referring to this current state where Israel is starting to come to their senses and know who Israel is. That's so right. it's a poor it's a poor interpretation of these verses. Yeah, poor. I mean, just look, it says in verse 12, I'll open the graves and cause you to come out of your graves and where? Bring you into the land of Israel. That's easily talking about the first resurrection. We should see that he's bringing them in to mm -hmm. the land of Israel, right? That's right. Yes, definitely. All those who kind of interpret it as being some type of enlightenment or overlooking the great truths. Scripture. Daniel 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that sh shall be found written in the book. So as we read some verses earlier on about the tribulation and those who were beheaded, and then the Ancient of Days comes, all of these things are overlapping. There are different descriptions of almost like the same thing, right? Dealing with the resurrection, as you're going to see here. This is dealing with the resurrection. This book here is dealing with the book of life, That's right? That's right. So this is during the, the future martyrdom, and they're going to still be delivered, all that are in the, the book of life. And this is how we know this is in the future. This is what we're going to see. Verse 2. And many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Praise Jah again. These are great, great hopes for us. We have a lot to live for. We have a lot to put effort for. This is why I think Paul says somewhere, don't let nobody steal your crown. Don't let no individual take take your salvation away. Don't love anything more than you love the Messiah and the Father at all. Because look at these great things that we're reading. Can you? I mean, it's unfathomable us coming back to life, living forever. We we can't comprehend it, right? Not something we can we can only imagine and think of it. But it's until you get there, the only way you're gonna know. And the same thing too, you know. Don't don't forget that if you don't get into Jah's kingdom. It's not like you're going to be somewhere else living some other type of life. You're going to be destroyed. And that destruction is going to be very sad for you. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, very painful for you. Very painful for your mind. 
and I mean, the fear of just being thrown into the lake of fire by the angels and being separated from Jah is um, the most terrifying thought that we could ever have. Being yeah. separated from Jah in that lake of fire, there's nothing more frightful than that. And Jah says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, right? Mm -hmm. Fear Jah, right? Fear him. Some people say, well, I don't want to be afraid. It should be. It's not real love if you're afraid. Well, <laughs> you better understand how this thing goes. And Jah wants you to fear him and love him at the same time. And, and again, it's like a parent-child thing. But fear Jah and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's right. And verse 2 is another clearly a, a good reminder that when you die, you don't go to heaven, right? You're That's you're right. asleep in the dust of the earth until you're awakened. And some will be awakened to everlasting life, and some will not. And they'll go into the second resurrection, which is the That's lake right. of fire. Everlasting contempt, being destroyed forever. These are the two resurrections, the first and the second, right here. Right. And it, and look what it says. It says to shame. Those mm -hmm. who come into the second, second resurrection are going to feel great shame. Because shame. They're going to realize that they had an opportunity when they were alive, which is now, to come to the truth. And Jah's just going to show them that they they turned from it. They right. they scoffed at it. They laughed. They they rebuked Jah. They blasphemed his name. And they're going to feel great shame for it. Mm -hmm. May Jah have mercy on all, us, all, all of us all because this is it's very... And that shame is not just being embarrassed. It's going to... You don't know. It's It's... It's shame at the highest heights. Highest heights, because it's going to be in front of the entire universe. All the yeah. angels, everything will be witness to everything. Every bold, and that's right. Wow. Good word, Dean. John 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of Jah, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Wow. Praise Jah mm -hmm. again. Jah again. Powerful, powerful verses here of our salvation. You know, you have, you have life and death, right? good and evil. What are you going to choose? And this is very plain to see for us when it comes to the resurrections, right? So, you know, some people might say, well, it doesn't matter, you know, if you believe you go to heaven and everything and all of this and that. Everything matters. And once people start saying this doesn't matter and that doesn't matter about the Bible and this is not a salvation issue and that's not a salvation issue, it's just a downplay of truth. Yeah. I you mean, know, if I it came out of Joshua's mouth, then it matters. It matters. Right? He said, heareth my words. If we believe in Joshua's words, then we're going to believe on him that sent Joshua, which is the father. That's right. So don't let anybody tell you, well, it doesn't matter if you do this. It doesn't matter if you do that. Or what you believe doesn't matter. And they believe all these other things. You know, John doesn't teach us like that. He teaches us that everything matters. He teaches us even from the smallest commandment. If you teach people to break the least commandments, you might not get into the kingdom of heaven. So everything matters, family. And, and um, it matters. I'm just saying it matters. You might try to find things that doesn't matter. And when I say it matters, it matters. But the most high, this is why he's the judge. And he can, you know, see beyond certain things. He can see the reins of the heart and everything. And he judges righteously. But remember, he's no respecter of persons. And right? that's what it says very clearly. Not a respecter of persons. So don't think your nationality can help you or who you are or your status and all of this and that. We're all at Jah's mercy. That's right. So come to that throne of mercy, ask for forgiveness of sins, and live a repentant life. Don't try to sneak away and think you can do things and Jah don't see it. And I mean, that's how people sin anyways, but you know, mature in the faith. Jah sees everything. And Jah's watching you more when you're by yourself, right? Because that's when people want to do sneakiness, right? When nobody right. is watching, 
no physical eyes are watching, but the scriptures say Jah's eyes are 10 times brighter than the sun, and he can see that's all right. things. I think it's 10,000 times brighter than the sun yeah, or something 10, like that. 10,000 times it says, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, oh, sorry, scripture testifies strongly that your our eternal life is in his son. If you reject his son, you are rejecting your own eternal life. That's right. And it's his and voice to, that's going to re resurrect you. Nobody else is. It's his voice. That's right. He came to die for us, right? So you were rejecting that that gift. It's like somebody's giving you a gift and you're like, no, no, I don't want it. But it's a very precious gift. So let's look a little bit more at this 1,000 year rule of the Messiah on earth and the rod of iron. Now, the rod of iron, seriously, is just meaning strict discipline, right? No joking here, right? When it comes to this rod of iron, when it says he's going to beat the nations and all of this and that, this means his rule is going to be absolute. Let's That's take a look right. at some verses. So I just want to make you know that the rod is equal to reproof, discipline, and punishment. That's what the rod, a rod stands for in the scripture. The rod is used to judge, reprove, and discipline. And failure to use the rod of discipline always results in ill temper, lack of respect, and outright rebellion. Mm -hmm. Scripture. Proverbs 23, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Sorry. Continue. Verse 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from the grave or hell. That's right. So disciplining your children is a good thing, right? In this world, of course, they don't want you to discipline your, your children. And you see what happens with society. Now, this society right. has been duped as the generation coming up, even, you know, whether it's my generation of, of where I am at in my age or the younger generation of like children. It's not a very wise generation, a generation that has been deceived into into the internet people think they're smart because you can google something and half the time you can google a thing you don't remember it even two weeks down the road or you know so to speak but everybody is going to this internet oracle and, and claiming and thinking that they're smart but you, know, you have to grow yourself uh, before i go on i like how um i guess the person put in who's their apost paul apostle paul apostle uh he says he's gathering the young now uh the rod is my pen i think somebody said that before um, I don't know if it's one of the apostles. My letters have to be done as written. Okay, well, if um, I appreciate Paul, to, for me, Paul, Shaul, Shaul, Saul, is to me one of the greatest champions. And I don't like to rank, of course, all the champions are great, and we know that. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, he even says that, you know, none of the apostles went through what Paul went through, right? The amount of um, tribulation. And the Messiah put that on him. I think Messiah even said he is a chosen vessel to suffer for my name's sake. That's right? correct. Because he was also persecuting the assembly. And so him being on that side and then being on the other side of being the persecuted allows him to give such great wisdom, you know, from his upbringing of being an Israelite under Gamaliel and knowing the law in and out. You know, it's great things. But yes, again, the rod here dealing with correction. As we move through. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Isaiah 13, verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. That's right. So God's going to punish this world. He's going to bring a, a rod of iron, right? To punish for the iniquity of what we're doing out here. Psalms 110 verse 1. Josh said unto my master, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Josh shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Jah sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jah at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. Mm. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. So we see again here, just all this understanding with the rod 
of iron, the rod of just strength, the judgment, what he's going to do when the Messiah comes at that time. He's going to crush the nations. Continuing. Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Joshua. Worship Jah, for the testimony of Jehoshua is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Jah. Yeah. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty Jah. That's right. So again... Just focusing on this rule, this this rule of, uh, with the rod of iron, right? Hey, thanks, Paul, for your understanding. But um, I have to say, yeah, just cool, man, because I don't hear what you're saying, even though I hear you. So sit back and enjoy the lesson. Otherwise, these claims of being uh, from heaven and stuff like that kind of sounds far-fetched. And it's better that you just listen and follow along with the lesson but yes as we see here brother again he's going to smite the nations right that's right revelation 20 verse 1 and i saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand oh sorry d let me take this one out continue yeah, we read this one already yeah 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 revelation 20 verse 7 and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and com encompassed the city or encompassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from Jah out of heaven and devoured them. Wow. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Forever and ever. Wow. So, yes, we can see what's happening after this thousand-year rule. So Satan is loosed from his prison. That's right. He's loosed, and then he still is able to get, gather you know, the heathens from Gog and Magog. And it's almost, it's, it says, an, uh, you know, numbered as the sand of the sea. That means multiplied millions, right? Yeah, I this, mean, this wow. Is, it's incredible. Yeah. To think that there's still going to be millions of people on the earth who are not following Jah. And even during the time of the thousand year reign is, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's let God's know. word be true, you know? Yeah, Jah's words are true. That's true. Yep. And Gog and Magog are. Those are Gentiles nations. That's right. Strictly from Japheth. That's right. Verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before Jah, and the books were opened. Now these and books another... here, sorry D, these books Go here ahead. are the Holy Scriptures, right? That's correct. Sorry, go ahead, brother. Yeah, man. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according mm -hmm. to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm hmm so these books is the holy scriptures right as we know that's right and, and they're gonna you're gonna be judged by the holy scriptures so you can imagine if people in the world who ignore the book of the most high his, his scripture 
and they don't know what's in there. It's because they kind of turn their mind to you know against it. I know a lot of people might say, well, what about people who don't have a Bible and never heard the other thing and all of this and that? You don't have to worry about those things. That's not even your concern. The Most mm -hmm. High knows what he's doing. And he has vessels that are chosen for destruction and vessels that are chosen for righteousness. But in this area here, we can see again that if your name is not in the book of life, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. So there will be a judgment at the end and you'll be judged by the things that are in the Holy Scriptures. And that's, it's a judgment. It's not going to be, you know... I think you're going to have to go through like a court case and a long, drawn-out thing. No. I mean, just going to probably just, all you have to do is press rewind on your brain. And your brain, which re is like a, it's like a memory bank and a recorder. You record through your eyes. You record sound through your ears. It's all, it's all locked into your mind. It's there. It's going to always be there. Even if you have dementia or anything, all the files are there. And then when it comes to judgment, all you have to do is just so you can't, so nobody human being can say, well, I didn't do that. I never knew that. I never knew this. Jack is going to press, you know, and I mean, I'm just using this as an example. Jack is press your mind and you're going to see yourself, so to speak, that you can't deny that you did these things and rejected John. That might be shameful to yourself and horrific that John may go through the wickedness that you've done. And it might be on display, which is, you know, might be a part of that shame. Yeah. I mean, when you look at verse 12, you know, being judged out of those books, there's many people who claim to believe in Jah and still believe that, you know, Jah's law is, is done away with. Not realizing it's that same law that you think has become obsolete, you're going to be judged by. That's it. It's called the curse of the law, right? That's right. That's the curse of the law that the soul that sinned shall die. Now, yeah, you might have sins that broken Jah's law, but if you have the Messiah and you have forgiveness of sins and you've been a repentant person and brought forth fruits worthy of repentance, you're going to be imputed with no sin, like you were righteous, because your righteousness is in Jehoshua the Messiah, Yahshua, Yahweh Shah, Yahusha, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's move on. How much time we got here? Okay, 20 minutes. Yeah. So we got to be overcomers, right, family? Overcomers with the Messiah. Revelation 2, verse 25. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Oh, see, so he's referring again to the millennial rule. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. So we will have we will be ruling with the rod of iron as well, right? If we That's overcome. Right. And notice what he says, keepeth whose works? My works. It's Messiah's works, right? Right to the end of your life, right? That's right. So who are these overcomers? Scripture tells us here. Romans 12, verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. First John 2, verse 14. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of Jah abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. First John 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of Jah overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Joshua is the son of Jah? Mm -hmm. Revelation 2, verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Yeah, a reiteration of what's up top. But yes, we can see here, overcoming means overcoming evil, right? With good. So you, you, that's what you got to do. You have to overcome. You have to overcome your sinful nature, what you have, right? That's who we are. We're, we have sin that's been passed on from Adam. And then we also have this wicked world, as it shows you, overcoming the world in John 5, verse 5, right? Mm -hmm. And we do this by believing that Joshua is the son of Jah. When it says that we believe that Joshua is the son of Jah, that he is Jah's son. That's so right. Jah is the Holy Spirit, right? And Jah is holy. And if Jah is holy and he's the Holy Spirit, then his son that he had was a holy one as well. Because only right. holiness can come from Jah. Holiness can't come from flesh, you know. <laughs> Jah That's can make right. things holy. Only he can make things holy. But holiness comes from Jah. And the Messiah is Jah's Son, straight from the bosom, the genes, the monogenes, from right from Jah. He's not has no type of uh, sinful nature in him that comes through mankind through 
man in particular through the sperm. And this is why when Miriam was, um, had him, he got his fleshly body and his all of the nutrients of, of a human being, but the nature of sin was not in the Messiah. He had a human body, which had a sinful nature, but he was completely above that. His He came from the Most High, and this is why he was able to overcome these things for us. He came in the flesh, but by the power of his Father giving him, you know, this great power that he had, he's able to save us from death as well. That's right. Well said. See, in the millennial reign, there's going to be certain Israelites that will be promoted to positions of high rank. Revelation 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even mm -hmm. as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. And that throne is dealing with authority and power, right? That's right. Psalms 47, verse 1. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto Elohim with the voice of triumph. For John Most High is terrible, he is a great king over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. Good. So the people will be subdued under their feet. Continuing. El has gone up with a shout, Jah, with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to El, sing praises, sing praises unto our king, sing praises. For Jah is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. Jah reigneth over the heathen. Jah set, sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the El of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto Jah. He is greatly exalted. That's right. So he's given us great, great positions. Now, one thing about this, though, is that, you know, this position is going to be given to you based upon your faith and the things that you do in this life. With what Jah gives you. So he could give you certain talents or gifts or certain things to help you bring others and bear fruit to the kingdom. If you don't do those things, you as well might be cast out because Jah's looking for workers. Not nobody's going to be sleeping on the job or too lazy to go work or might be even, you know, I don't want it to be, Jah forbid, but, you know, my people might be ashamed of preaching, you know, the Messiah to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of just hold it to themselves or whatever. And I know how it goes because Christianity and the mainstream has basically, you know, watered down scriptural talk. So when you start talking about the Bible, people think they've heard it already or you sound like a religious quack or a Bible thumper, all of this. And they have all these names, but we still deal with truth and you still got to use your flavor, your salt to, to work in Jah's vineyard to help others get into the kingdom as well as to have good works to help yourself get into the kingdom as well. And everything, even though we talk about works, it's about faith. And remember, faith is dead without works. Dead without works. That's right. And to add to that, we think we read earlier in Revelation that there's going to be those who will turn many to righteousness, and they will shine as the brightness of the firmament. So it's all, right. about, it's all about, one, save yourself, and two, bring salvation to others. That's right. Luke 19, verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was near to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of El should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered up them and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him, and he sent a message after him, saying, we will not have this man right to reign over us. Sorry. All right. So we see here, this is about Jah's kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So the Messiah is the nobleman. He's, he's going to receive a kingdom for himself. So he goes to heaven, right? To come back to earth to receive his earthly kingdom. But he's caused these 10 servants to take care of things on earth, right? While he's up there. But you notice that the people, they never liked him, right? They never liked no. his ways. So they didn't want the Messiah to rule over them. Let's go on and move on to some more. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So again, keeping in mind here, keeping in mind here that 
he's given something to these servants and they're supposed to do stuff with what they what they have and that's the same thing when it comes to you i mean there's this um about the the 10 servants and there's another one about the talents and there's all kind of different things and he's giving you these understandings saying that hey you have a work to do here right and if you don't kind of do that work in faith you still might lose your eternal life because john needs people to you know to do to 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 work in the harvest and as we said, I think last week, you might have a place at Jah's kingdom and at the table, but if you don't live up to your part, that's just going to be filled in with another person. That's how it works. That's right. Continuing. Verse 16. Then came the first, saying, Master, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. I like this. So, you see, we're getting to an understanding of the millennial reign. Mm -hmm. Look at that. So, you see how the Most High is going to be distributing the authority, right? Because the earth is vast and you have, you know, authority over 10 cities. Wow, that's great. I mean, even right. one city, just being a mayor of one city and that's your authority, that's fantastic. But look at this great authority he gives because this, this um, servant here was very faithful and he took his one pound and turned it over 10 times that's very efficient very effective worker that one is and we all want to be like him because that's right look at that what he did continuing the second came saying master thy pound had gained five pounds and he said likewise to him be thou also over five cities again a great great thing this man is putting the resources that Jah gave him to work and he's bringing in more, bearing fruit. And this is what we have to do. Goes to show you that Jah will reward you according to the fruits that you bear. That's right. If you bear a lot of fruit, then you will receive a lot. If you bear mm -hmm. little fruit, then you will receive a little. Receive little, that's right. And another came saying, Master, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou, thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest thou not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Master, he had ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. And when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. So we get a good understanding of this parable, right? Mm hmm this 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 servant here even though he had the, the one the one pound he's given he didn't do nothing with it and he even claims out of his mouth that you know the messiah they know he's serious and he's strict austere means strict and serious and he's, he has such power he can he wherever he even doesn't lay off he can pick up as well he has great authority and great power and even though he's saying this and people know that the messiah is strict and everything he says out of your own mouth will i judge you wicked servant so this servant was considered wicked because he just put it in a napkin and didn't do nothing with it. That's and right. Even if he wanted to be super lazy, at least, is what the Messiah is saying, at least you could have brought it to the bank and let the bank make the money for me, right? That's right. Because you don't want to do it yourself. And that would have at least, he would have maybe even would have got at least one city. But what's unique is that his one pound is given and taken to, given to the guy who has 10 pounds. No, meaning he's going to have another extra city. That city of rulership that would have been for that one servant that had the one pound, he would have still got a rulership over a city, but because he didn't do anything, he rules nothing, and he gets destroyed for it, right? That's right. I mean, this this goes to the same um, notion that, you know, your, your place in Jah's kingdom, Jah can remove you and replace you with somebody else. That's right. Right as we start to finish off, we got about maybe seven year, seven minutes left here. 
Okay, let me just take a look here. What I want to bring up for my um, yeah. Okay, we will start right from there. We'll stay here. So again, we're focusing on the one thousand year rule of the Messiah and Israel on Earth as we almost finished understanding the prophecies that the nations will be Israel's servant. Now, I said this before earlier on, but I want to kind of explain it one more time here. The Israelites and Gentiles of other nations that accept the Messiah shall get eternal life and be immortal in God's kingdom for 1,000 years. So, I need a brother, Israelites, Israelite brothers and sisters to understand this as well. If Gentiles come in the kingdom and they get in and they get eternal life, no one rules over those Gentiles except the Messiah. They're getting eternal life. They're going to actually be rulers over things in the world. They won't be ruling over other Israelites or anything of that nature, but they're going to be given 10 cities as well. They're going to one city, two city, whatever it is. And a lot of people kind of get this thing mixed up. The believing Gentiles that joined Israel before the Messiah came and the ones that come after the Messiah came, of which the pr Messiah promised that all who believe in him could get into the kingdom. Those, coming into, those Gentiles coming into the kingdom are going to be immortal beings. Nobody right. is going to be ruling over them. Like Israelites aren't going to be ruling over another immortal being. Immortal That's beings right. are going to have their own authority, right? And their own righteous, authority. Hmm? Go ahead. Righteous Gentiles will not be resurrected to become servants. No. They will be rulers with their brothers, the, their Israelite brothers. Their Israelite brothers, they will be rulers with them, alongside them. And that's what's not taught. And that's what has to be taught because that's the truth. And anybody who teaches otherwise is going against the words of the Messiah. Not me. As well, the Israelites and Gentiles of other nations that reject the Messiah shall die in their sins and go to judgment, the second resurrection, right? The lake of fire. So even if they're Israelites by blood and Gentiles by blood too, if they read all those who reject the Messiah, they're not coming into this kingdom as well. Israelites too. And this is what it's about, about saving people who are not, you know, who are, are moving in righteousness and not dealing with wickedness. Another thing here is that the descendants of the Gentiles and other nations that are alive at the Messiah's return will be servants for Israel in the 1,000-year reign here. And salvation will be offered to them. They can either accept it or not. And when you read the scripture, a lot of people just don't read it properly. Just as he's going to destroy all these nations. And those, all those things are true. But there will be a remnant, a few, a little bit of those other nations that are going to come to the Messiah. That's just how it works. You can't stop that. But yes, when he says he's going to destroy Edom and all these places, whatever. Mm. Yes, that is very true. But those who are in the Messiah, they won't be a part of that destruction. And that's what some people have to kind of get through their mind. And if they can't see it that way, then again, they're not listening to the Messiah's words. And then those who accept the Messiah during the 1,000 years will die and come back in the judgment, but they're going to get eternal life and their names will be in the book of life. So Gentiles are other nations that, you know, who accept the Messiah when he's on earth during that 1,000 year reign. And that's going to be, 1,000 years is a long time, man. A very long time in terms of none of us have ever lived past even 100 years, never mind, you know, going that far and, and your body doesn't age. But they will be in the, uh, they'll get eternal life. Those who are wicked during this time here still and reject the Messiah. They're going to get the plagues and they're going to lose their eternal life same way. Make sense, D? Yes. Yeah. And this has to be clear because it's, it's not clear amongst many of our, our brothers out there. That's right. Psalms 2 verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Jah and against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Josh shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Jod said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. So we know that Jah is the father and his anointed is his son, the Messiah. And this is verse 7. This is the Messiah again speaking, right? Jah, I will declare the creed. This is Messiah talking. Jah said unto me, my father said unto me, you are my son. This day have I begotten thee. That's right. 
finishing it off. Verse 8, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve Jah with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Praise Jah. Praise Jah. So we have to deal with the Messiah, the son as well. And we can see here that the father's, you know, appealing to the, the kings of this earth. Hey, be careful. If you don't deal with my son, then you're going to get it. And this is how it's always been. He always came to Israel first and then the other nations that way. And let me just find an appropriate verse here to, um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to just finish off this with this small part here. There will be, uh, let me see here, there will be a part two to this lesson because I want to read all the verses that talk about, um, there's verses that speak about how the animal nature is going to go back to what it was before the kingdom. Mm. Uh, it's going to talk about how there'll be mortals playing in Jerusalem and old men in the streets and all of those things. Um, talks a lot about, you know, uh, war, military weapons being molded into gardening tools and farming tools. And all of these things we will take another time. But there's something I want to bring to your attention. And this is this verse here. And I find it quite unique. And maybe you can tell me what you think about it, D, okay? This is called bring again the captivity means return and establish. This is what this word, this is what it means. Return and establish, bring again the captivity. Mm -hmm. And let's look at a set of verses here that are very unique. Take them in. Jeremiah 30 verse 2. Thus speaketh Jael of Jazreel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith Jah, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Jehudah, saith Jah, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that Jah spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. So you notice what it says, I will bring again the captivity of my people. That means he's just going to restore them back to their proper place, right? Yes, that, that to me is clear, yes. All right. He's not putting them into captivity again. Exactly. He's taking them out of it. He's bringing them out of captivity, yes. Yeah, and putting them where they were supposed to be, establishing them in the land. That's right. Because he says, I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to right. their fathers. So this means he's going to reestablish them back, right? That's right. Verse 5, for thus saith Jah, we have heard a voice of trembling, and of, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that, great, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's troubles, but he shall be saved out of it. That's right. This is one of those verses dealing with Jacob's troubles. But yes. what I wanted to focus on here is this bring again the captivity of my people because I was searching through the scriptures on this topic and I found something kind of unique. I hear a lot of people talking a lot of stuff about certain nations, but mm -hmm. take this in here. And this is the last slide. Wait, Verse wait, eight. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not the last slide. This this is the slide I want to bring. Yeah, this is the slide here. Go ahead. Ezekiel 39, verse 25. Therefore thus saith the Adon El, Now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name. Jeremiah 48, verse 47. Yet will I bring again the captivity of Moab in the latter days, saith Jah. Thus far is the judgment of Moab. Whoa, what do you see there, D? What does it say he's going to do with Moab? He's going to bring again the captivity in the no, latter days. Latter days, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, Moab and Ammon family are Lot's children. And Jah loved Lot. Lot is even called in the scripture, he's called righteous Lot. Right? 
So, so they're the he's children gonna of bring the... them. He's going to bring them out of captivity too in the latter days. That's right. He's going to establish them too because that was what he wanted to do. Because remember, he loved Lot, but the children of Moab and Ammon became Israel's enemies because they never let them cross their land. Yes, right? sir. and they were yeah. they were kind of against them that way, and that mm. was their problem. But they shouldn't have been like that because that they're like their siblings. They're not siblings. They're their family, right? Because Abraham and Lot yeah. are, are. I think Lot was Abraham's nephew. Yeah, it's a very interesting verse, yes. And it says he's going to bring Moab back in the latter days. Look at this. Jeremiah 49, verse 6. And afterward, I will bring again the captivity of the children of Ammon, said Jah. Wow. Afterward, the latter days. Mm -hmm. mm. Jah's okay. mercy is different than people think. You know what I mean? Because man, many times he says he's going to destroy Moab and Ammon. But look what's happening now. Mm, and he even said he's going to destroy. Hmm? Yeah, no, in the latter days, he's going to bring them again. Mm -hmm. out of the captivity amongst his, his people. Verse 39, But it shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring again the captivity of Elam, saith Jah. <laughs> wow. Ezekiel 16, verse 53, When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, <laughs> and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them. Wow. Some heavy stuff here to think about, right? Is this just saying that, you know, he's he not saying that he, all of these nations were wicked. He's not talking about their wickedness. He's saying that he's just going to save some that are righteous who have not dealt with the wickedness of their nations, right? Yes, Sodom and Samaria. Mm. And look at this last one here. Ezekiel 29, verse 14. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return into the land of Pathros. In the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. So when it says they're going to be base kingdom, they're going to be a humbled kingdom. Because you remember, yeah. Egypt was the prime and you know the head at one time, very boastful and braggy. But yes. just as somewhere in scripture, you know, Egypt is my people too, right? Egypt, of Egypt, course. and um, certain things are his people. So I just bring out these verses, family, for a lot of people want to talk about which nation could get in and which can't and stuff like that. When you start to look into Jah's word, you start to see a lot more than meets the eye. And Jah's mercy does extend. And these are the words of Jah. He said he's going to do these things. So woe to those people who want to fight Jah, right? You don't want to fight Jah in this area. No. Um, yeah. No, these yeah, are I'm, great I'm, verses to bring to these are great verses to bring to our attention for sure. Yes. So I'm going to end it here, right, family? I want to, as you know, next week or next Sabbath. We will um, try to get into prophecies regarding ruling over the nations. There's many verses that will go to detail of how things are going to go on and what the servants are going to be doing and who's going to be serving who and all of that. And um, that's it. But I want to, you know, give thanks and praise to Jah, our Father, and His Son, Jehoshua, the Messiah, who died for our sins, that we may have eternal life and forgiveness of sins, who's also a Nazarite as well. I want to thank all who, um, who, you know, tuned in on this live lesson here. And hail up all the brethren, the assembly of Jah, Auntie Alma, all the way down from the oldest to the youngest, my family, mm -hmm. uh, Sister Janessa, Sister Carice, Sister Andrea, Paul, Holy One, all who are in here today still, Johnny and the likes, Greggy. I don't I always forget names. So I'm just every all the brethren of Zion, one love, and uh, mm -hmm. stay strong, fight the good fight. Uh, D, you want to finish off with anything here? Yeah, man. Um, great work today, as always, Brother Sean. Mm -hmm. May Jah strengthen all of us and all the brethren and sistren. And keep the faith and let's pray for each other. And have a blessed week. All right, brother man. Look a bit more. Yes, Lion. All right. One love. One love to everyone. All right, family. Unless you have any uh, comments or questions. John says, thank you, Brother Sean and Brother David. Yes, thanks for appreciating the work. Uh, praise and glory to the Father. I got um, some people here showing me here. What's it? Okay. All right. Hey, love, sister. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thank you, Sister Andrea. Sister Janessa, bless up everyone. 
Thanks for listening. One love. Praise John.